Well, it helps if you turn the volume up on your computer. <laughs> Hi, everybody. How are you tonight? Oh, my goodness. Yep. Oh, let me get my chair right. <sighs> so it's Thursday, last day that Bob had to go to Seattle. So I, I had had this great plan to get all this stuff done while he was gone the four days, so every day during the day, and I kind of didn't get all this stuff done. So today I decided I had to get it all done. So if I yawn, I apologize. But that's what, you know, cleaning out the garage, building new shelves, or putting all the paint stuff away, getting stuff ready for Saturday sale. Yeah, kind of worn myself out. But I'm ready for stories. And I'm ready to say hello. There's Linda. Linda, Linda, Linda. Oh, it was snowing this morning here. Oh, my gosh. I, I have seen places all around. My friend Katie that lives in um, near Amesbury, Massachusetts, she has snow. Um, it's just craziness. Just craziness. But, yeah, that's the way it goes. Um, and... Uh, Virginia. Yes. Did lasted about an hour and then melted spring in Virginia can be like 72 and the other day. Yeah. That's just, oh, I'm in Virginia. She says, it's a story night with Gretchen. Get comfy, get a drink, relax. So same non-spill glass that spilled on me the other day. But, hopefully, I'll set it to the side where I can't reach it very well. I've got water, too. <sighs> Thanks, you guys, for hopping in when I did that unboxing. I realized it wasn't very fun because I, I didn't, like, connect anything. But I should have had everything all organized of where I was going to hook it to. But I didn't. So that's next. It's sitting over there. I'm kind of looking at all this stuff going, I didn't, I was going to do that this afternoon and thought, you know, that that's silly to unplug everything before just an hour or two before you have to go live. I'm learning. Maybe I'm learning. Hmm. Um, sun came out and it's been cold today. Not get to the nursery. It rained and the roads used to get there, go through creeks. Yikes. Ah. Oh. Hey, La Julia is here. Nice to have you here, Julia. Uh, it's actually me that doesn't live in California. <laughs> yes, Larry lives just across the water from me, which is, I mean, he's lit probably, uh, my friend that lives on Day Island is like nine miles away, but it takes an hour to get there <laughs> because you have to go up and around. You can't go across the water unless we take It'd still take an hour to get there if I went by water. But, um, yeah. Anyway, Tamara's here. Linda is in Virginia. Uh, Lupe's in New Mexico. Uh, Larry is in Tacoma, Washington, like me. And I'm in, I'm in Long Branch, Washington. Um, Tamara is in, I forget what town she's in in Australia. Why is it? Uh, oh, well, slipped my head. Um, can't find the magpie story yet. Oh, okay. When I was little, like you. All right. Yay. So Julia's here. Um, so like, uh, Julia, I, um, one of the things, and I've asked for, and I think you were here on Sunday, is... Tamara's looking for a story from Australia for me to read on my 500th show on the 14th. So, um, like that, all kind of things. Yay. And Julia, where are you? Where are you? Uh, on this place in Florida. I'm tired of being away from my family. Oh, you're going to move to Florida. Oh my goodness. I, I've been texting somebody today, sent me a text message this morning, said, it's a lovely day. Do you want to play tennis? And I wrote back, uh, wrong number. And she said, isn't this Annie? And I said, nope. And she said, 
oh, sorry to bother you. And I said, oh, no bother. Just not, not anywhere I'm playing tennis. And, you know, and she said, well, um, for all your trouble, if you're in Miami, I can buy you a cup of coffee. And I said, oh, opposite corner of the country. I'm outside of Seattle. <laughs> anyway, yeah, Wisconsin has some yucky winners. And there's Larry. Um, I didn't, I did not get them. No, I had, I didn't send them back. I didn't bought it. Like I said, I, I was going to set them up and then realized I needed to unplug everything and re kind of move things around so that they had a spot to sit. Cause they're bigger than I, I a little bigger than I thought, but they're still a small size that they'll be okay. And we'll see how they go. I, I just, I didn't throw the box away when I cleaned the garage today. I did not throw that box away. I did throw a lot of other boxes away. And hey, there's Angie. And I had so many bottles with paints and stuff like that. I mean, just, oh, hardly wait till I get my studio done. But we're having a hard time getting an electrician to come out and run electricity for us. People are just not wanting to follow up. They say they'll show up and then they don't show up. And it's just like one of those things. Um, all right. So we live in Wisconsin, go to Florida for the winter. Okay. The land down under. <laughs> yes. I, my neighbors are actually, so my neighbors are snowbirds in a little different way. They come here for the winter because they live, the other place they live is in Nelson, Canada, which is across the border up, you know, near, near, kind of near Kelowna, BC. And, but it's, it's, like Eastern Washington is very much colder. They're up north of that and it's much cold, colder. So they go there for the summer and then come down here for the winter. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Uh, the kangaroos are moving in. Do you find anyone to do work these days? Yeah, it is. It is tough to find. So today, um, stories, stories tonight. Two, I, I called it two sides of the law. Because they're two really fascinating stories about two pretty fascinating men. Um, one who has come to light and has a television show about him, actually, I think. But <clears throat> I first, I mean, remember when this, this picture book came out and was in my library and learning about him and hadn't known anything about it. And the other person was just one is another book by Emma Bland Smith that was just really fascinating. But two sides of the law. And so I'm going to hop right into those stories for you. The first book is by uh, Vonda Michaud Nelson. Let me get her. There we go. There it is. Um, so she grew up the youngest of five children in Elizabeth, Pennsylvania. Her parents brought books to life into her life on the day I was born. My mother found my name in a novel she was reading. <laughs> her credit, she credits her love of books to her mother and her father and faithfully read to her every night. As a writer, she hopes to give young people some of what her parents gave her opportunities to grow through story. Wanda's love of history and family is reflected in many of her award-winning books. So we'll go down here. Let's see this, the book that she wrote here, she received the 2010, I'm down here, Coretta Scott King Author Award for Bad News for Outlaws, The Remarkable Life of Bass Reeves, Deputy U.S. Marshal, which also earned the Simon Weisenthal Once Upon a World Children's Book Award Award, a Carter G. Woodson Honor, an Ann Izzard Storyteller's Choice Award, Award, and was a Western Writers of America Spur Award finalist, as well as a Washington Post Best Book of the Year. Whoa, that's a lot of stuff. Um, so she has some great pictures here about her and, and her life is when she was her parents, when she was about five, about nine type of things and a home book. She's done a fair number of books, Small Shoes, Great Strides, um, a lot of Step Into Reading books, A Letter Buck, George Fletcher, The People's Champion, uh, Don't Call Me Grandma. Ooh, 
I may have to read that one. And the Book Itch. I think I read The Book Itch to you guys at one point. Truth in Harlem's Greatest Bookstore. Um, anyway, this is the one. Bad News for Outlaws. The Remarkable Life of Bass Reeves, which I think I have set right. There we go. Here it is. Bad News for Outlaws. It's really kind of fascinating. Uh, the illustrations are by R. Gregory Christie, and they're done in just a really fascinating way to create that old time and whatnot. Uh, pretty remarkable at the time that this person lived, how what they did. But here it is. Let's see before I jump in. Uh, what would she do? Tamara had them all texting. <laughs> I told my kids I'd adopted a kangaroo. Oh, oh, did you do that for April Fool's? Oh my gosh. Did you do that for April Fool's Day? Oh gosh. Those April Fool's kind of got out of hand this year I, online. It was crazy. Let's see if it says what the illustrations are made of. Um... I'm trying to see, I don't see where it tells me what the illustrator used. Nope, I don't see it. it. Might be tiny writing and I just can't see. For Drew who led me to Bass, for Art T. Burton who helped me to know him, and for Bass Reeves who was someone to ride the river with. The research that was done on this is pretty fascinating. Showdown, Indian Territory. 1884. Jim Webb's luck was running muddy when Bass Reeves rode into town. Webb had stayed one jump ahead of the lawman for two years. He wasn't about to be caught now. Packing both rifle and revolver, the desperado leaped out of a window by a Bywater's store. He made a break for his horse, but Reeves cut him off. Bass hollered from the saddle of his stallion warning Webb to give up. The outlaw bolted. Bass shook his head. He hated bloodshed, but Webb might need killing. As a deputy U.S. Marshal, it was Bass's job to bring Webb in alive or dead. Bass had put Webb behind bars before, but the outlaw was back on the run. That would end today. Webb couldn't outrun a horse and knew he'd hang for, the, for sure this time. In a last-ditch effort to escape, Webb stopped in his tracks, turned, and let loose with his rifle. Webb's first shot grazed Bass's saddle horn. His second shot cut a button from the lawman's coat. Webb's third tore the reins right out of Bass's hands. Bass chucked, ducked his head dove off his horse and rolled to his feet just a f as a fourth bullet clipped his hat brim. That was Jim Webb's la last shot ever. Marshal Reeves fired two rounds from his Winchester rifle and the outlaw was done for. As he lay dying, Webb told Bass, you are a brave, brave man. I have killed 11 man, men and I expected to make you the 12th. Webb gave Bass his revolver out of respect. Bass buried Webb's body and turned in the outlaw's boots and gun belt as proof that he'd gotten his man. Being a peace officer in the Indian Territory was rough and dangerous. The area swarmed with horse thieves, train robbers, cattle rustlers, and gunslingers. Bandits, swindlers, and murderers thrived. Travelers sometimes disappeared, never to be heard of again. A lawman's career could be short and end bloody, so Bass Reeves had a big job. And it suited him right down to the ground. Everything about him was big. Bass stood a head taller than most men of his time. He had broad shoulders and huge hands. Bass was so strong, he single-handedly pulled a steer out of the mud up to its neck while a bunch of slack-jawed cowpokes stood speechless. Bass sported a large, bushy mustache and wore a wide-brimmed black hat. He rode tall, powerful horses. 
But the biggest thing about Bass Reeves was his character. He had a dedication to duty few men could match. He didn't have a speck of fear in him. He was as honest as the day is long. Slave Days, 1840s to 1860s. Bass spent most of his early years as a slave in Texas. Even as the young, a youngster, his star shone bright. Bass was sharp-witted and good-natured. People liked his pluck. He had a special way with animals, especially horses. Bass tended livestock and fetched water for the field hands. And while he worked, Bass sang. He sang about pistols and rifles and knives. He sang of bandits and killers and thieves. His mother feared her boy might go bad. She couldn't have been more wrong. Bass took, his, took to guns like a bear took to honey, but he always handled them with respect. He grew up smart and decent and had nothing but right in his heart. His owner, Colonel George Reeves, took bass hunting and entered him in shooting contests. He liked showing bass off. Bass impressed his owner so much, the colonel took him along when he went to fight in the Civil War. But one night, something happened that changed everything for Bass. Folks say the two men argued during a card game, and Bass struck his owner. For a slave, this meant certain death. Bass made tracks for the Indian Territory. Freedom and Family, late 1860s to 1874. Only Native Americans were supposed to live in Indian Territory, but some Indians accepted blacks. Bass lived within the tribes, learned their languages, and perfected his marksmanship. As he roamed the frontier, Bass felt a freedom he never knew. Still as a runaway slave, Bass had to keep on the dodge. Finally, the Civil War ended, and the slaves were free. It was safe for Bass to settle down. He bought a spread in Arkansas, just outside Indian Territory, and married a pretty woman named Jenny. True to the song of his life, Bass had a big family. He and Jenny and their 11 children worked the land and raised hardy livestock. Bass's life was good, but times were hard for folks in Indian Territory. The vastness of the wild country offered countless places for bad men to hide. The territory became a haven for the West's most notorious outlaws. Settlers in Indian Territory had had enough. Even though, they are mo though most were squatters who had put down stakes illegally, they still wanted protection. Deputy U.S. Marshal, 1875 to 1900s. In 1875, the U.S. government sent Judge Isaac C. Parker to bring law to the territory. People called him the Hanging Judge, and the mention of his name made outlaws who'd never spent a day in church whisper a prayer. The judge hired 200 deputy marshals to track down outlaws in the area covering 74,000 square miles, larger than what would become the entire state of Oklahoma. Bass Reeves was one of them. He became Judge Parker's most trusted man. Bass was perfect for the job. He knew the territory and its people, downright handy tools for tracking chemical criminals. And his skills with shooting irons was already the talk of the territory. Bass was blazing fast on the draw and as good with his left hand as with his right. He would say he was only fair with a rifle. But Bass had such a crack sh was such a crack shot, he was barred from turkey shoots at picnics and fairs. He always won. One sharpshooter said when Bass stood firm and took careful aim, he could shoot the left hind leg off a contented fly sitting on a mule's ear at the hundred yards and never ruffle a hair. Like most former slaves, Bass couldn't read. But 
This didn't stop him from doing his job. Before going after wanted men, he had the arrest warrants from Judge Parker read to him. Bass listened carefully and memorized the shapes of the letters for each name he heard. He memorized the charges against each person, too. When, then he'd hit the trail. Even when he got 30 warrants at one time, Bass always brought in the right outlaws. Bass could be out a man hunting for weeks. He slept on the ground under the stars and worked in bitter cold and sweltering heat. Like other deputy marshals, Bass traveled with a chuck wagon and cook a guard, at least one posse man, and a tumbleweed wagon to transport captives. Hmm. Many lawmen of the time weren't much better than the hard ones they arrested. But Bass was as right as rain from his boot heels up. He couldn't be bribed. And he shot only as a last resort, even when Judge Parker said, bring them in alive or dead. Some outlaws like Jim Webb forced gunplay. Whenever Bass could, he found another way. Bass took many a bad men by surprise through the year, but through the use of disguise. One day, he'd pose as a cowboy. Another, he'd be a tramp, a gunslinger, or an outlaw. Even horses played a part in his disguises. Like many U.S. Marshals, Bass rode some of the finest. Most times he forked a handsome sorrel. Bass rode proud in the saddle. There was no mistaking his silhouette. But prize horse flesh could be a dead giveaway that the rider was a lawman. Bass always kept some rough stock and rode lazy while undercover. Rode lazy. What a great term. He planned every capture carefully. When Bass caught wind that two outlaw brothers were holed up at their mother's cabin, he rounded up a posse and made camp some distance away. Bass knocked the heels from a pair of worn boots and shot three holes in a floppy old hat. He hid his badge, handcuffs, and pistols under ta trail-worn clothes, then started walking alone to the hideout. It was a long walk, 28 miles. Bass wanted to be sure that if the brothers spotted him, they wouldn't suspect he was the law. When the outlaw's mother answered the door, Bass said he was tuckered out and hungry. Showing the woman the bullet holes in his hat, he claimed a posse was after him. She took Bass in, fed him some vittles, and even let slip that her boys were on the lamb. When the two arrived, they agreed to partner up with Bass, and after sharing some laughs, everyone went to sleep. Everyone, except Bass. At sunup, the brothers awoke in handcuffs. They were dumbstruck, but their ma was fit to be tied. As Bass led her son's way, she followed for three miles, calling him every bad name she knew. <laughs> On a different warrant, Bass pretended to be a farmer. He rented some scrawny oxen and a run-down wagon. Bass drove the rig to the hideout of the men he was tracking. He ran over a stump on purpose and got a wheel caught. The outlaws came out to help. They wanted to get him away from their hideout. Just as the criminals fixed up the wagon, Bass jerked his colts. Seeing it was a deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, all four outlaws threw up their hands. Bass brought in wagon loads of criminals, as many as 17 prisoners at a time. Being a church-going man, Bass reckoned he could do more than put bad men behind bars. In the evenings after supper, he talked to the outlaws about the Bible and about doing right. Getting through to them was like trying to 
find hair on a frog. <laughs> but Bass kept trying. Now and then, captured outlaws tried to get the better of the marshal, but Bass was tough and unflappable. One day, while he napped, a skunk moseyed into camp and stopped next to Bass. Captives changed to the tumbleweed wagons, threw stones at the skunk, hoping it would spray the st its stink on the lawman. But when Bass awakened, he didn't flinch. He reached out and gently petted the skunk. <laughs> Word spread that Bass was a square shooter, but a hard man. Outlaws learned that when Marshal Reeves had your warrant, you were as good as got unless you hightailed it out of the territory. One outlaw named Hulabee Sammy did just that. With bass on his heel, heels, Sammy mounted a swift black charger that flat outran the marshal's sorrel, but bass was patient. He could cross paths with Sammy on another day, and bass would get his man. Even the infamous Bandit Queen, Belle Star, admired Bass. Belle was about as far from tender as boot leather. She trifled with the likes of Jesse James and didn't cotton to lawmen. But when she heard Bass had her warrant, she turned herself in for the first and only time in her long, lawless career. Bass was respected and hated. Some whites didn't like the notion of a black man with a badge. Desperados simply wanted Bass off their trails. Bass had to be on the lookout day and night for the bad men who were out to dry gulch him. And the danger was a small matter for this lawman. But danger was a small matter for this lawman. Duty was his guide. Right and wrong were clear and simple. One day on the prairie, Bass came across an angry mob lynching a man. Without a word, Bass cut the man down, put him on the back of his sorrel. This was near as risky as a grasshopper landing on an anthill. But the mob just watched in awe as he rode off. They recognized Marshal Reeves and dared not interfere. Bass's devotion to duty was legendary. His sense of justice was never more tested than by his son, Benjamin. One awful day, Benjamin killed his own wife after they'd been, she'd been untrue. Bass was so well-liked that no one wanted to arrest his son. For two days, the warrant lay on the desk of the marshal in Muskegee. When Bass returned to the jail with prisoners, he got the sad news. It was painful, but he did what only Bass Reeves would do. He arrested his own son and turned him over to the court. Although he was sentenced to life, Bass's son was a model prisoner and was pardoned after serving just 10 years. Oklahoma Statehood, November 16, 1907. Bass Reeves' life as the Deputy U.S. Marshal ended the day Oklahoma became a state and Indian Territory ceased to exist. State and local lawmen took over the federal marshal's duties. Bass Reeves served as a Deputy U.S. Marshal in Indian Territory for 32 years, longer than any other. In fact, he was the only deputy who started with Judge Parker and stayed clear through statehood. He arrested more than 3,000 men and women, blacks, whites, and Indians. Many were desperate outlaws who knew Bass rode for Parker and figured they had nothing to lose by fighting to the death. Bass had many close calls but was never wounded. Remarkably, he killed only 14 men in the line of duty. Now the finest deputy U.S. Marshal of his time was out of a job. Bass bucked getting put out to pasture. He hired on with the police force in Muskegee, Oklahoma. Bass was nearly 70 years old and walking with a cane. But he still put the fear of God into lawbreakers. During his two years on the force, not a single crime occurred in his patrol area. 
One fall day, Bass Reeves left work feeling ill. Two months later, on January 12, 1910, he died of a kidney ailment called Bright's disease. Hundreds of people, blacks, whites, and Indians, attended his burial. A fellow lawman, Bud Ledbetter, called Bass one of the bravest men this country has ever known. And one white homesteader said Bass was the most feared deputy U.S. Marshal that was ever heard of. Over the years, the name of Bass Reeves faded, like one of those horses they call, uh, heroes they call unsung. But his story has folks talking again, talking about the big man who helped bring peace to a big country, Deputy U.S. Marshal Bass Reeves, a true champion of the American West. It has a whole, I love this because it has a whole dictionary of Western words. Hold up, hide and lynching. On the dodge, also called on the lamb, pluck up on the lamb. Put your right as rain, running my And then the timeline of what happened went on. So here um, is when he he died of in 1910. But in in March 1992, Bass Reeves is inducted into the Hall of Great Westerners of the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum in Oklahoma City. So. Let's go to, what did that, oops, page I was looking for was not found. Okay, go back to here, close that. Oh, shucks, I closed the wrong thing. Hang on, you guys. Oh, I gotta get Kindle. There it is, for the next book. I closed the wrong tab. Darn. Pay attention, Gretchen. Pay attention. So what's everybody saying? Well, that was a cool book. So there's another one of these the individuals from history that really um, you have, have no, I mean, yes, there is now, there's a TV show, there's more interest now. But in my childhood, in a vast majority, you never heard about this type of uh, the, the the extent of that he had in history, you heard about Jesse James, you hear about all the other people, uh, Wyatt Earp and all that kind of stuff, but not about an amazing black U.S. Deputy Marshal named Bass Reeves. Wow. Um, <laughs> Oh my gosh, I'm going back and catching this. <laughs> this is this is a good April Fool's joke. Uh. <laughs> uh. It's a rare Bob sighting. Did, we, did you guys see Bob? Did he sneak in here? Oh, I didn't see him. Uh. <laughs> Bass Reeves. So, did he sneak? <laughs> okay, whatever. Um, okay, I'm checking his brights. is an inflammatory disease that Stain Jones is getting magical. This book is awesome. It is an awesome book. It was one of those that when I got it at first in the library, I was like, hmm. Because I didn't really know, and it was fascinating. We had a uh, the kids and I had a good time going through it because it's a really fascinating book of the way it's put together. Um, yeah, he really lived in that over three thousand. Just it just amazes me. It's just totally amazing. So that that's the first side of the law, one side of the law for this. You know, two sides of the law. The second book that I have is another book by Emily Bland Smith that um, I found, and it's it's illustrated by Jen Ely, who did the other one that we talked about. And 
this one is about someone who started completely differently, um, not on the good side of the law, but ended up in prison and how that all came about. This is called, uh, let me see, let's see, on your picture that is usually you, your phone's been blowing up and your picture that is usually you reading was you and Bob. What? My phone is? Oh. Oh, fiddle. How funny is that? <laughs> okay. Let's see if I can get this back on what it's supposed to be doing. Why was it doing that, I wonder? There, okay. A rare, I have my phone on do not disturb. Why would it be doing that? I have it on do not disturb is on. Huh. Okay, well, we'll see. see if it's going to behave this time. I'll have to watch that. I didn't watch that very carefully, obviously. Rare Bob said, yeah, that picture that we have, that, that picture that showed up is us in New Orleans at the Sugar Bowl. Anyway, the book, next book I have for you tonight is called The Gardener of Alcatraz, A True Story. And like I said, this is, this is another one that um, is, it's just really, of all the things I've ever heard and learned about Alcatraz. This was not an individual I knew about or had heard about. Um, but it's a really interesting story. So here we go, the gardener of Alcatraz. And I'll watch that, see if it stays as me. The gardener of Alcatraz, a true story. And this, the illustrations are done. I can't read it. It's too fuzzy for me to see. Little tiny print. The boat chugged out of San Francisco and into the bay. Sound nice? Hmm. It wasn't. This was no pleasure outing, let me tell you. Gulls squawked, a foghorn moaned, and Elliot Michener, prisoner number AZ578, Stared into the fierce wind. A head loomed an island topped with a concrete fortress, watchtowers, and barbed wire. As the 20 new inmates m marched off the boat, Elliot felt full of dread. How had things gone so wrong? Five years ago, he had had a life, had life figured out, printing counterfeit money. But making fake money was a crime. He'd been sent to the slammer, first in Canvas, Kansas, and now here at Alcatraz. Surrounded by water, steel bars, Elliot saw nothing but gray. There was no way he was staying here. He'd bust out and go back to counterfeiting or maybe rob a bank. Sure, security was tight on Alcatraz. No prisoner had ever managed to escape, but Elliot was smart. Maybe he'd be the exception. As the days crawled by, he lay low. He endured the no talking rules. He avoided the riots. He performed his dreary job scouring the grounds for handballs that had been knocked over the wreck yard wall. Make no mistake, it was a tedious life. Until the day when, so they say, Elliot stumbled across something that was most definitely not a handball, a key. Elliot could have kept the key, tried it in every gate on the island. Why didn't he? Between you and me, he was probably scheming. 
He figured that if he did something honest, something you might not expect from a prisoner, it could pay off. So instead, he handed over the key. And our story takes a turn. Because you see, it just so happened that the big bosses on Alcatraz were looking for an inmate to help with the gardens, which sorely needed attention. Of course, it couldn't be just anyone. It had to be someone honest, <laughs> someone they could trust with a little extra independence, someone who would say, turn in a key. Elliot got the job. Now, Elliot didn't know a darn thing about plants, but he figured that his job had to be better than picking up handballs. His first task was breaking ground up the soil, breaking up the soil on the island's west side and creating ter ter terraces. He threw himself into it. Gardening wasn't half bad. It was hard, satisfying work. Elliot decided he might as well get good at it. Hmm. What's more, this job could be this ticket to freedom. The gardens were outside the prison walls. Elliot found a quiet spot where the guards couldn't see him, and he started building a contraption that he hoped would allow him to swim to shore. Once he was tinkering with some rubber tubing when a guard surprised him. Elliot cook, crooked something up about it being a, a sprinkling device and the guard swallowed the story hook, line, and sinker. <sighs> Phew. Elliot finished the terraces. He learned which plants went where and how much to water them. He was too busy to focus on his flotation device. As time passed, a funny thing happened. This gardening thing started to grow on him. He studied seed packets and books from the prison library. He built a greenhouse and tried out composting. He even created his own Narcissus hybrid. Elliot Michener planted every square inch of the island that he could. Color spread from outdoors to in. Prisoners picked flowers to put on their water glasses, in their water glasses. To get supplies, Elliot would talk a guard into buying him seeds or bulbs in the city. In exchange, Elliot would slip the guard some flowers for his wife. <laughs> Elliot didn't think much about escaping anymore. <laughs> Look at the inmate with the flower in his, in his pocket <laughs> and, and the food line. <laughs> Seven years passed. By now, Elliot had gotten such a good reputation that he was promoted to work for Warden Swope and his wife in their home. Swell. His official job was keeping the house tidy and cooking the meals. But in his free time, he kept on gardening. This jailbird, you see, had grown an honest-to-goodness green thumb. Mrs. Swope liked gardens, too. The dignified lady and the tough Alcatraz inmate became friends. She loved roses and he was happy to grow them for her. The two unlikely friends listened to the radio together and they both enjoyed horse racing. <laughs> they followed the races and cheered for their favorites. On Elliot's birthday, Mrs. Swope gave him a new pair of shoes. After a while, Elliot was taking care of the house for days at a time when the Swopes went away. They trusted him and treated him like a person and that made his life on Alcatraz bearable. The island had changed in the nine years since Elliot had arrived. The gray was gone. In its place was green. 
and other colors. Pink snapdragons, red geraniums, purple iris. Elliot too had changed. He knew sedum from sage and dahlias from daffodils. He also had passion, pride, and solid skills. He could see a colorful future for himself, one that didn't involve breaking the law. And here is where our story takes another turn. One morning, Elliot got some unexpected news. He was leaving Alcatraz. He was going to Leavenworth, a lower security prison. Wouldn't you think he'd be pleased his punch? Hmm. Nope. Believe it or not, Elliot begged to stay in Alcatraz, the toughest prison in the country. But he had no choice. He packed his gardening manuals, and though color bloomed all around him, once again, he saw nothing but gray. The boat chugged toward the city, and Elliot Michener, prisoner number AZ578, no longer, stared into the fierce wind he had left as he left the island he had helped transform. Leavenworth was bleak. There were no gardening jobs for prisoners. Elliot was desperate to get out. He knew what he had to do. Escape? No, sir. He stayed on his best behavior, kept out of trouble, and asked to get out early. And get out early he did. When Elliot was released for good behavior, he went to work on a farm in Wisconsin. For the first time in ages, he could breathe fresh air and grow his beloved flowers. Once more, color filled his life. Elliot never went back to crime. Gardening had sure enough been his ticket to freedom, just not in the way he'd expected. So it shows here, um, he, what happened was after two years, so he went, when he left uh, Leavenworth, he went to an honor farm. He was still on parole, basically, and so he was working on this farm, and he was on parole, and happily, after two years of good behavior, he was, he, oh, he was put, he was par paroled to the dairy farm in Wisconsin, where he, his counterfeiting buddy, Rick, uh, was working. The two former partners in crime worked hard, determined to prove such uh, as they had changed. As Elliot wrote to his, um, to his pro, you may not be aware that we're going to we're doing good lives, and um, their employer was fond of them both, and six, uh, proceeded to trust them. Oh, I'm, I have just a second, you guys can't read those. This is not clear in this book. Let me switch to Libby and maybe I can see the back pages on this book better. Uh, where is it? There it is. The Kindle Cloud Reader version was not as clear, but it ha was bigger, so... There we go. Oh yes, this is much clearer. There. So um, he um, he never forgot the kindness of Mr. Swope, who had advocated for his early career, and they corresponded frequently. And the warden often addressing Elliot as "my dearest Michener." In one of the letters, Elliot wrote, "I'm learning how much better one can do living honestly than by, say, counterfeiting." And then before signing off, the tough guy turned gardener added one more thing. He asked the warden for a very special favor. Could he and Dick possibly have a cutting of their favorite Alcatraz rose? After several years of impeccable parole reports, Elliot was permitted, permitted to move on. In Southern California, he married and led a productive life. It continually amazes me that so many good things have happened, he wrote to Mr. Swope. Ain't that something? 
According to one source, Elliot became a landscaper later in his life, putting his gardening skills to good use, and he passed away in 1997. So the Alcatraz Gardens, um, it shows, here's a picture Elliot found something to care about in his gardening, a picture there. It was much later on that uh, the gardens today, it was in 1972, the island was taken over by the National Park Service in 1972, and in 2003, two nonprofit agencies, the Gar Garden Conservancy and the Golden Gate National Parks Conservancy, combined forces to begin restoration of the gardens. Today, more than 200 species of plants flourish on the island. Some of the roses that Elliot tended for Mrs. Swope still exist, and two of the greenhouses have been rebuilt on their original foundation. The lush landscape is the legacy of the prisoner gardeners of Alcatraz Island and a metaphor for the resilience of the human spirit. He said, I'm grateful for my introduction to the spade and the trowel, the seed and the spray can. They have given me a lasting interest in creativity. Wow. Ah. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, the, the, it, it wasn't just the gardening, but the fact that the warden believed in him. Yeah. It's frozen again. Little Gretchen has frozen again. Well, ah, why does it keep going off? Oh, well. I didn't switch it to the camel camera because it's supposed to do that, but it's not behaving. Um... We've got okay. I think that that was just it was just I, th I thought those two stories. It was just such you know I mean the hardships that Bass Reeves went through as being a slave, and then even though he was well respected or supposedly with by his owner, but then they got in the fight and he had to escape. And how that turned around, what eventually happened for him, but still being a black lawman at that time probably was not an easy life. And then this guy, this guy, he was born in um, Idaho, the, um, this guy was let me find it again um, uh, he was born in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho he was convicted of counterfeiting charges in Duluth, Minnesota and sent to Leavenworth prison in 1936 but he was born in 1906 in Coeur d'Alene just not too far away Anyway, so those are my stories. I have my funny little phone that plopped up again. I don't understand. Oh, well. It's, I'm not going to use the brain space to try to figure it out. <laughs> Trip again. I'm glad. I'm glad you like them. What are the names of these books? The name of the, the one book, let me show you here, is... Get back to the cup. Um... This one, um, okay, one of them is, boom, boom, The Gardener of Alcatraz, A True Story, and this one is by Emma Bland Smith, and then the other one is, get me back here, is, uh, da, da, the... Oops, that's at the front of it. Take you. Come on. Bad News for Outlaws, The Remarkable Life of Bass Reeves by Vonda Michaud Nelson. Yeah, that's the name of them. Julia, I'm glad you liked them. Buckets Overflowing. 
Yay. I'm glad you liked them. They're just, it's just, it just, it just struck me how oh, completely opposite sides of the law, but still this kind of struggles that they went through and how, what they made the best out of it. The, I mean, to become a gardener on Alcatraz and all the things that was going on and it was, yeah, just amazing. But that's what I have for tonight, you guys. That's what I have. I have these two stories. So Sunday, uh, art day, more time. I have, what have I been doing? I went to Tarts the other, oh, we had Atelier class. Um, I haven't done much of anything. I've been, I'm doing a kind of a abstract study kind of thing of practice to get practice on it. And I'm not very far. We'll see how it goes. But Saturday, this Saturday, I am doing um, up at the Long Branch Improvement Club from nine to three, Larry and Angie, if you guys want to zip over and say hi, I will be, <laughs> it's, it's a super sale of everything. So in the Long Branch Improvement Club, you could have bought a table for $35 or you could be out in the, in the big field for $15 and sell. And people out in the field are going to be selling out of their trunks of their cars and stuff like that. I literally am taking the van up, popping the own awning open aside, and I'm having a uh, inventory before the bonfire sale. <laughs> inventory reduction before the bonfire sale. I've just got some stuff that has been around for ages. I don't care if people want to buy it just for the frame or if they want to take the picture out and cut it up for uh, for collage or they want to paint over it, whatever I got, uh, you know, on those, a bunch of stuff there. Then I've got some other stuff too. And a lot of this stuff is like 10 years old at least, but it's been, yeah, inventory. So I'm going to just bonfire sale cost and add that for the day. And it ought to be fun. Um, Bob's going to try to finish taxes. And, um, so, but that's, that's, that's what I'm going to be doing on Saturday. I'll tell you how it goes on Sunday. We'll see what happens with that. But um, the Long Branch Improvement Club is this place up the, up the way that was originally like a school or something. And now it's on the historical register. It's a really cool, we have, it's, it's funny out here. They have all these improvements and, and it, yeah. And it, they do fundraisers. They do they, we have an open mic night. We have uh, dances. It's a place that people can have events. There's a jazz festival there in the summer. Um, it's got a great, beautiful kind of uh, wooded walkway area kind of behind it that's all kept with trails and everything. It's cool, cool old building, uh, you know, because this area has been around since uh the late i think like 1886 18 or or so earlier and uh when it was said long branch has been around a while so it's going to be kind of fun and that's the long branch improvement club was one of the early things so that's what i'm doing on saturday we'll see how much stuff i can get rid of hopefully i get rid of stuff and art, art and things like that and who knows what else I can get rid of. Maybe I'll take some, oh, I could take some mats up there because I have some mats I could sell. Yeah, that I don't use because I don't use colored mats. I only use white or black. I never use colored mats and I have a pack of colored mats. Anyway, you guys, I'm babbling now. Um, tired enough. That's what happens. I wish we weren't sickos. You're sick? Her, then me, then her, then me. Oh, no. Oh, no. Well, it, we're outside. You know, it's going to be outside. So if you're feeling better, and you, uh, 9 to 3, and if you, you know, come on down to the key. The key is the place to be. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> Dang. <laughs> he just... <laughs> 
Sounds like the place our son had the wedding. Oh, could be. Yeah, it's big, long, wooden, kind of log-type building, wooden, um, and the interior is just huge, cavernous place. A big old, long, uh, kind of dirt parking lot with big grass area. And there's a there's a jazz festival out here. Oh, I'll have to find out when it is. I can't remember when it is, but it's a, it's a great, they have, they have fun, fun times. Um, so yeah, I, all right, you guys, I'm going to stop babbling. I'm going to go watch the great Canadian pottery throwdown. The new episode is out on YouTube. Um, and, uh, go check in with Bob, see how he's doing. And you guys, I will see you on Sunday. Send in your art. I want to see what you're doing. Because about all I'm doing is doodling. Do, 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 do. Doodly do. Doodly do. Guadaly acha, guadaly acha. Doodly do. Doodly do. Simplest thing. There's not much to it. All you got to do is doodly do it. I like the rest, but the part I like best goes doodly doodly do. You guys know that from camp? That was a camp song for us. Where did that come from out of me? It is time for me to go. <laughs> so I hope your buckets are full. I love you guys all bunches. Thanks so much for being here. And until next time, <laughs> keep looking for the beauty hidden in plain sight. I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> it's all around you. <laughs> but the first place you're going to find it is when you go look in the mirror and all I'm going to see when I look in the mirror is a crazy woman but that's okay because crazy is kind of beautiful at times <laughs> I'll see you Sunday you guys <laughs>